Anybody? Am I the last one? Anybody? Good to go, Mr. Chairman. Give me just a second. <clears throat> okay, um, welcome to the Wednesday, May 27th, 2020, special meeting with Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, can we please have the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? <coughs> I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, under God, indivisible, indivisible for liberty, with liberty and, and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Uh, can we have the roll call? Chairman Adams, Councilor Devereaux, here. Councilor Gabrielson, here. Councilor Garvin, here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, here. Councilor Penelope Jordan, here. Councilor Straw? Here. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you so much. Um, before we get to our uh, planned agenda items, uh, is there anybody joining us from the public tonight that wishes to speak on something that is not on tonight's agenda? Uh, if you do want to speak about something not on the agenda, if you could at this point raise your hand uh, using the raise hand function in the Zoom meeting, and we will queue you up for your comments. I'm not seeing any hands raised. So we'll move on from that. Uh, the first item uh, on the planned agenda is number 78-2020. Uh, the fiscal year 2021 municipal general fund budget approval. Uh, we held a public hearing uh, on the budget uh, a week and a half ago, uh, a little over a week and a half ago on May 18th, where we went over uh, the municipal general fund and special fund budgets. Uh, so this item is for the approval of uh, the budgets uh, that we have included in tonight's agenda. Before we get to any council discussion, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this agenda item? Again, use the raise hand function on your Zoom meeting. Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Um, so uh, without any public comment, is there any counselor wishing to make a motion at this time? I'll help you out, Jamie. Um, uh, Mr. Jordan? Yeah. I'll use the draft motion here. Um, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, having held a public hearing on May, on Monday, May 18th, 2020, does hereby adopt the Municipal General Fund Operating and CIP Expenditure Budget for fiscal year 2021 of six. Eighteen million eight hundred and two thousand seven hundred ninety-four, not including overlay, with estimated non-property tax revenues of nine million nine hundred and eighty-two thousand one hundred and eighty ninety-two, and estimated property taxes of six million eight hundred and twenty thousand six hundred and two. Those big numbers are tough for me, um, and hereby adopts the following revenue budget and gross 
appropriations for each listed department as follows. Do I need to read all of those? No, I think just as outlined in the in the agenda. As, as yeah. outlined in the agenda uh, for the May 27th, 2020 meeting. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Jordan, with the motion, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilor Gabrielson. Uh, is there any council discussion? Councilor Devereaux. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, I, looking at the um, unassigned fund balance, and maybe John can answer this, um, why are we using so much of the unassigned fund balance when we've got our budget down really low? Um, can you talk to us about that, John? I can to a certain extent. Um, I believe the intention was to have as little impact as possible on the estimated tax rate for the next fiscal year. And we either uh, anticipate more revenues than is, we would reasonably receive, we reduce expenses, or we use uh, the additional fund balance to reduce the uh, potential tax rate increase. Mm -hmm. So basically this would be, we're using this large unassigned um, fund balance, this por large portion because we believe the school budget is gonna come in at 6.95, is that the reasoning? Um, it, it's not for me to say anything about the school budget. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be politically correct and beg mm -hmm. off that, that answer. Well, I'm, I'm just curious because it's a lot of money that we're um, using from our unassigned fund balance that if we just look at our municipal budget, we don't need to put it in there. And don't we need some sort of a, uh, a cushion in case um, during this next year, we don't get revenues from the state? And um, you were saying that we have like a one month reserve. Don't we need more of that unassigned fund balance for our town reserve? I believe you do. Um, <clears throat> the uh, school budget is not before the council this evening. When it comes before the council next month, the council can adopt it as presented, can increase it, or could decrease it and send it back to the school board to make adjustments in how they're going to operate given whatever action the town council takes. That's why I'm reticent about getting into that conversation. Matthew, it looks like you're trying to step in. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, looking at the overall numbers that are being employed uh, from the existing unassigned fund balance, what we're using this year out of that, uh, the larger number is mostly $1.6 million of that amount. And 1.3 of that is being used towards operations as well as funding some of our capital expense. $300,000 of that 1.6 is going to offset the deficit that's been generated over the years by the uh, rescue fund, if you remember us talking about that. And then uh, the other parts are the use of uh, uh, carry forward funds operating in CIP for projects that are currently uh, used. So it's not uh, that overall larger number, but there is a combination of unassigned funds that we have, which was you could call it undesignated surplus, unassigned fund balance, uh, but basically our, our savings as well as uh, as monies that are currently in this year's budget that will be going towards uh, expenditures in next year's budget. Okay, I guess my question is then, if we don't approve the basically 6% increase that the school's looking for, can we reduce what we've already agreed to put into our general fund from this unassigned fund balance. We wouldn't need a, that, we wouldn't need the 1.6 million if um, the school budget is lower, correct? I'd probably look at them both functioning independently of mm -hmm. each other uh, is kind of way way I would look at that. Um, we know that we can meet our obligations on the town side using the, the revenues and the uh, meeting our expenditures with the current as it's currently constructed. Uh, but it's not a, it's not 
it's not a one for one swap, if that makes uh, any sense on the school side, if they, you know, as they, if they decide to make any changes or if any changes are made, it would directly impact on their operational side. But at this point in time, I, I think we're, you know, it wouldn't make a great, great enough impact or it wouldn't be a, a push on the other side. So if you took a dollar out of the school side, would a dollar go back to the town side? It wouldn't, it wouldn't function like that as well. All right, thank you. Yeah. I, I just want to jump in and, and recall back to the conversation that we had that I appreciated Chris bringing up last, last meeting as well, that involves both our policy and I think also our philosophical obligation um, to the taxpayers where if, if we have money that's in excess of a certain amount in the fund balance, we have both a, a, a policy statement um, about what, what's to be done with that money um, as well as I think, uh, uh, like I said, sort of a philosophical obligation to, to return that money to the taxpayers in the form of, of lessening the burden in this fiscal year, uh, this coming fiscal year. So like Matt said, I, I think regardless of any discussion uh, on the relative merits or not of the school budget, um, even, even when looked at in just through that lens, um, I, I, there's, I think, merit in in the number that's presented. Chris, I don't know if you want to follow on to that to reinforce the point you made last time. Yes. Yeah, so, so we we have a, um, as Jamie noted, uh, the town council. I think it's like 2011 or something like that. Adopted a, a policy saying we're supposed to have a particular. Uh, once our general fund uh, balance exceeds a particular amount, we're supposed to start looking to use it to reduce taxes going forward or otherwise spend it on. Uh, capital improvement projects or something like that. I'm probably completely butchering it, but you can go look it up yourselves. Um, <laughs> but basically what we've done over the last few years is we've, it's been building up, building up, building up. And we've, uh, at least in my time on the council, uh, when I came in, it was the, what are we doing with this? And there was a discussion of let's focus on what are the long-term capital improvement projects the town needs and use the money in that way to pull ourselves down into the range from the policy. And as was noted last month or last meeting or whatever it was, um, there's an argument to be made that the policy is uh, perhaps too aggressive in that uh, it might be more prudent to have a larger balance, um, but the policy is what it is at the present moment. But one reason why we are pulling down so much, my understanding, and Matt, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, is because we have 2.3 million in capital improvement expenditures in the municipal, bu municipal budget. So that's where I understood um, a lot of that draw is going to it. It's things like the paving and drainage, the sidewalk right. segments, the police radios, the new communications tower. So it's unrelated. It's not directly tied to anything relating to the schools. It's the CIP projects on the municipal side that we're continuing to invest in, which is causing the drawdown, which as Jamie noted, was driven by it, uh, in part the policy that the town council adopted a decade ago, whenever it was. Okay. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, yes, Councilor Stroud, you, you are correct, and, and as a result of that, we are able to do many of the capital without uh, having an impact to taxes and still accomplishing the uh, the capital needs for the town in this year's budget. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quick to try to remind the council that there there are approximately 1.3, almost 1.2 to almost 1.3 million of capital projects that were removed from this year's budget. Uh, to try to get to this point and uh, those un unfortunately uh, aren't going away uh, they're just going into the future so uh, they they still will exist out there and uh, you know our, our thought is to as we finish up this fiscal year and find what we have for unassigned funds that may result from uh, the end of this year's fiscal year and audit that will put those monies into the unassigned fund balance and use those for capital projects next year and and keep that as a motion to funding it. Uh, the concern is obviously uh, if you consistently year in and year out just use that to fund operations, you don't have that to take care of your hard your hardscape needs or your hard your hard infrastructure needs that the town's done a really good job uh, funding for years and, and planning for. So uh, I think we're going to be in decent shape when we get through uh, at the end of this fiscal year. As uh, as you noted uh, last week when uh, after John had reconciled our revenue sharing uh, receipts that we are at $15,000 above anticipated. So we're in decent shape, at least in fiscal 20. Uh, when it comes to revenues, our uh, 
excise tax revenues are starting to, to come in more vigorously than before. And the July, uh, sorry, the June 1st, uh, I, I, I guess you could call it uh, um, forgiveness uh, 60 month or 60 day period that we had from April 1 to June 1st for non-payment non of taxes and not having interest accruing during that window. Uh, will help us to also generate some additional revenue uh, or anticipated property tax revenue that should be coming in. And uh, so I think we're in decent, sh decent shape there. We have had some savings. So uh, we will be reinvesting that into unassigned fund balance for next year. And we'll have a better picture for that when we get into fiscal year 22, uh, once, we, <laughs> once we get to fiscal year 21. <laughs> oh, I, uh, one other quick item if it, uh, to please the council. Uh, John and I have, were on a uh, conference call with Joe Quattara of Moores and Cabot today, and uh, he provided us with some, I would say, uh, extremely encouraging news on the refunding of the, uh, of the bond from last meeting, as you recall. Uh, we had anticipated a $70,000 savings over the period of the uh, term of the refunding, and uh, I'm afraid I have to report that it's, it's actually going to be closer to 109000 that we're going to uh, save over that time period due to the attractiveness and uh, just a really good environment for that. So uh, that's a good way to start the week. Hmm. That's good news. Uh, Valerie, did that address your... Did that discussion yeah. address your concern on that point? Do you have anything else you want to add to it? Or are you ready to move off of that? Or I I'm ready to move off. Thank you. Yep. Uh, is there other discussion from the council? Jeremy, you raising your hand? Or oh, sorry. Penny's can you see? Yep. Can you see my hand raised? Did you see right, my yep. hand raised? Yeah, I I saw Jeremy adjusting his glasses and confused it for a hand raise. <laughs> but over to you. No, did you see Penny. my electronic one? Yes, I saw Jeremy first, though. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, that's okay. all. Um, anyways, um, I'm not going to belabor the subject because, um, um, Jamie, you kind of hit on the answer or uh, the point uh, relative to Valerie's point. Because I don't see that we are uh, taking um, steps around our budget in order to um, offset the uh, school budget because we need to have that discussion at a later date. I'm seeing that we're doing this because it's the right thing to do at this point in time from a uh, economic perspective. Um, I, if I thought any different, I wouldn't uh, have uh, put forward the motion. So anyway. Okay, thanks, Penny. Other discussion? All right. Um, I'm in favor of the budget as presented uh, and uh, want to again compliment Matt, John, the rest of the staff for their work um, to very diligently um, be, you know, very ever mindful of our current fiscal uh, environment and uh, their efforts to turn over all stones and um, go down, um, you know, certain paths, even if they didn't bear fruit uh, in terms of, uh, you know, considering, uh, you know, what were, I think, some pretty unique asks from the council and some counselors in particular um, around looking for savings and, and trying to reduce expenses and things like that. So I just want to, um, you know, again, thank you all for the work uh, that you've done to get us to this point. Uh, I know what a challenge it was and what a challenge it will continue to, you know, to be heading into the new fiscal year. And, and as you said, Matt, looking, looking ahead down the road to fiscal 22 as well. Um, so if there's no further council discussion, uh, I'll look to call the question. Oh, Penny, do you? Sorry. Yeah, I just want I I just want to make sure that there are certain things clarified before we head into a vote because I want um, 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 many of the citizens to recognize uh, and I'm going to bring up the turf field. I'm sorry, um, but I think that 
um, the city, that people need to recognize that we did, we debated this a long time, we came to a conclusion. And a conclusion being that um, as we move forward over the next 12 years, we're going to have a different policy in place around funding. And so I just want to assure people that that is something that's on the radar that we will be doing and will be taking very seriously. The other thing is, is that Matt, I'm, I would love it if you would articulate how the $600,000 line item is being um, uh, funded and how much it will actually, and I'm sorry, I just think we need to make that point to people that how it is going to be um, paid for over a five year period, uh, that there was X amount of dollars available to uh, pay it down to a lower amount that the school put in. So if you could just articulate that so it's on the record, I would really appreciate it. Penny, I'm glad you introduced the topic. I, I was surprised that nobody else did. Um, so uh, before turning over to Matt to give the explanation that you just asked for, I just want to acknowledge, you know, we, we did receive a good amount of input um, from folks, uh, you know, mostly by way of email, um, but I know other people have been reached out to individually and personally on the topic. Um, so I just want to thank the people that, that did, um, you know, reach out and communicate with us, um, expressing their opinion for or against um, uh, this particular line item. Um, as you said, Penny, and as Matt, I know, um, you know, give us good detail for on here. It, it's not a lump sum one time um, expense that's all being generated out of fiscal 21 um, property tax revenue. So uh, Matt would very much appreciate um, you sort of breaking that down just for the public's clarification as well. Sure. Uh, thank you. I, pre I appreciate the question. I think it's uh, important to get the detail out there. Uh, over the past dozen years, uh, the town and the school together have combined funds, uh, starting off with a lower number, then increasing that number over time. Uh, to this point, they've saved approximately $275,000 of the $600 for the project cost. Uh, that leaves a remainder of $325,000 uh, in this year's budget. That what we're looking to do is go out to a short-term uh, lease purchase agreement and fund that over five years and that would be roughly $65,000 per year estimated or in that, in that range with the low interest rate environment that we're sitting in, uh, we should be able to uh, meet all the needs for the project and get this done and then also have it being cost effective to the taxpayers over the next, over the next five years. But that's, that's what our plan is. Uh, phase two of that, because uh, this is the, we're living in the era of phases. Uh, phase two will be in the next, uh, in the FY22 budget, uh, both the town and the school should be planning on funding uh, what you call funding. Um, oh, sorry, I'm having a, a, a brain freeze. Uh, funding depreciation, sorry <laughs> for a moment, it's been a long day. Uh, funding depreciation, so uh, what we'll end up doing at the end of 12 years should be having the town and the school uh, setting aside funds in their operating budgets so there is enough saved to, to fund it without having to increase or raise taxes uh, or go out to borrow at that point in time. So uh, find some hybrid approach where the town puts in X amount of dollars, the school puts in Y amount of dollars, and then also reaching out to uh, the, the booster clubs and finding ways that they could also find a way to contribute uh, to help in the overall uh, operations of the field in the going forward manner. So. Uh, the, the thought is possibly having the town put in 20000 per year and the school put in 30000 per year over the next uh, 12 years to accumulate roughly 600000 and replace everything anew and then have it set aside. And I, you know, to be frank, I think that was the original intent, uh, looking at all the different notices and speaking with former school board members uh, and going through the mists of time to hear what their recollections were and how things were uh, supposed to be done. Uh, has been actually a very fruitful exercise for the town and for us to go through to try to to find out what the best way to do this is. But I think, you know, quite frankly, it comes down to putting aside a small a small amount every year and then having that grow and then being ready to replace that when it's ready. So that's uh, that's the short term and the long term plan for that. And uh, the turf uh, technology has improved dramatically over time. They are seeing longer lives. 
So hopefully we can have that uh, well put to bed by the time we do have to replace the turf surface in, in 12 to 15 years. Thank you, Matt. Um, are there any questions from anybody on what Matt just laid out? The other thing I did want to just take a minute to clarify, because I think there were some comments that we received in some of the emails that we got um, that I would just like to either clarify or, or correct. Um, and, and it goes to the point of, of the town and school, you know, jointly funding, but at perhaps a, a, a different share or different ratio going forward is that both the school and the both the schools and the in town services um you know are users of the facility are users of the field um, we had some emails that seemed to indicate or think that it was merely a school facility or had a, only a school use um, and then there was a question and you know matt your answer sort of addressed it um, of well hasn't this been saved for over the last number of years since um, the field was originally installed and the answer to that is yes and that money is there and some of it um, uh, and that it's, it's going to uh, fund a portion of the overall expense um, the the reality is is that it's not enough to cover the entirety of the expense and so it, you know we're using what's available there from what has been saved for but not um, it, it doesn't it doesn't cover the full balance if we go forward with this so um, so Penny thank you for bringing that up um, and again thank you to all the folks who um, communicated to us uh, with their opinion on the on the topic um, is there any other discussion or any other points that people want to make Councilor Devereaux I just want to um, commend Matt and John and all of our department heads for doing such a great job you know they put together this budget, got it all to us, and then a few days later had to redo the budget, get it to us again before the hearing, which before our meeting, which was amazing. And then they looked at it again, made cuts, looked at it again. I don't know how many times you guys have looked at this and reworked it. And I just wanna say, I so appreciate all the work and the dedication and the leadership that's been shown on this. Um, thank you so much. It's very appreciated. Thank, thank you. That's that's very kind. So thanks. We we try to do our best. So I appreciate the the support. Is there any other discussion? Any other comments, questions? Okay. Seeing none, uh, I'll ask uh, Deb to. Uh, call the roll. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? No. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries six yay, one nay. Five, five one. Oh, yep. excuse me, five yep. one. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay, uh, next up is item number 79-2020, uh, fiscal year 2021 municipal general fund budget summary motion concerning property taxes. Um, this is basically a uh, motion to uh, commit the uh, tax payment dates uh, and uh, schedule of interest um, for late payment, et cetera. Um, is there anybody from the public that wishes to comment on this item? Seeing none, um, is there a motion from any counselor? Penny read it last time. I can read it this time. Go, Go ahead, Jeremy. Councilor Gabrielson. Um, I move that the council, having held a public hearing on Monday, May 18th, 2020, does hereby adopt the following items concerning property taxes. One, to fix October 1st, 2020 and April 1st, 2021 as the dates upon which one half of such tax is due and payable under MS, under 36 MSR, subsection 5. Two, 
interest to accrue upon taxes due and unpaid after each date at the interest rate of 9% per annum. Three, authorize the tax collector and town treasurer to accept or decline prepayments of taxes not yet committed or prior to any due date and pay no interest thereupon. And four, fix the interest rate for taxes paid in excess of the assessment at 5% per annum. I'll second that. Moved by Councilor Gaberson, seconded by Councilor Penny. Jordan, is there any discussion? Um, Matt, I, I just have a question as it relates to the action we took that you referenced earlier that's due to expire June 1. Um, what, what would be, I, I assume, if sort of worst case scenario planning and um, were uh, economic conditions to warrant it, et cetera. I mean, we, we would have the same ability to uh, take action like we did, you know, for the April timeframe if we, if we felt we needed to come October in subsequent time, right? That's correct. Uh, the exec, uh, one of the, one of the recent executive orders issued by the governor had, uh, had bestowed upon towns that ability. Uh, it was, I think it was two executive orders ago uh, that, that that had taken place. So, uh, and before then, we had we had received uh, guidance that we were still okay uh, taking that approach earlier. So, but she has since provided clarifying language to say that the town has that ability to do that going forward. So, um, these this is pretty much a standard fair language. Uh, the legislature sets the uh, maximum interest rate, uh, so that's why the council adopts that. Uh, generally, but if you do tend to or do intend to do that later in the year, you still will have that flexibility. Okay, so it's uh, I was what I, and I maybe didn't quite as clearly as I wanted to first time around. So it's it, it, regardless of the particular state of emergency that we may or may not be in from a declared perspective, the town retains the ability to be flexible with its own um, forbearance or or suspension of of some of those things, right? Yes. Okay, thanks. Is there any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, uh, Deb, could you call the roll for the vote? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next is item number 80-2020, uh, the property tax levy limit. Um, again, this is uh, effectively setting uh, the ceiling uh, per statute. Um, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak about this item? Seeing none. Uh, is there any counselor wishing to make a motion? I'll do it. Okay, Penny. Um, the town, uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council hereby increases the property tax levy to municipal services to $8,063,733 in accordance with 30 AMRF. 5721-A. Thank you very much. Moved by Councilor Jordan. Is there a second? I'll second. Councilor Devereaux, is there any discussion? Again, Matt, this is a standard language perfunctory vote that we have to take compelled by statute, correct? Uh, this is this is an item that's been on the council agenda since the LD1 uh, was, was placed into there. Uh, goes back in, uh, uh, quite a long time now, back to the Baldacci administration is when they came forward with that. Uh, John and I were speaking about this. There's, there's no enforcement capacity that comes from Augusta on this, but it, it exists in law. Uh, the interesting thing is though, uh, and we are, as you may notice by looking at the budget, we are below what the uh, tax levy limit is. Uh, however, uh, my experience, has been over the years and my former life as a councilman in gray was the town was hamstrung by not increasing the levy limit as they go along, even though we might've been underneath it. But 
uh, and if you don't keep increasing that to meet where the law allows you to be uh, in one of those years, you may find that you are uh, hamstrung uh, going forward. So what we try to do is just keep that in line with what, uh, what the legally permissible limit is so the town can protect itself in the long-term future. Thank you. Is there any further discussion or questions from anyone? Seeing none, we have the roll call vote, please. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Number 81-2020 is the fiscal year 21 municipal, municipal special revenue funds <laughs> budgets. Again, uh, these were discussed in our Monday, May 18th uh, public hearing. Uh, before moving to council discussion and vote, is there anybody from the public wishing to speak on this particular agenda item? Seeing none, is uh, there a motion from councilor? I'll do it. Council Gabrielson. All right. The Cape Elizabeth Town Council having held a public hearing on Monday, May 18th, 2020 does hereby adopt the Municipal Special Revenue Fund Expenditure Budget for fiscal year 2021 of $3,816,447 and an estimated revenue of $4,017,281. Hereby adopts the following revenue budget and gross appropriations for each of the funds listed as presented in the agenda. Thank you very much. Is there a second? I'll second. Council Penny Jordan. Any discussion? Um, I know that we've gone over this quite a bit. Um, just again, for the more for the benefit of the public, Matt or John, is there anything that you wanted to add or any additional commentary that you have at this point? Mr. Chairman, I think that I. Uh... I, I've spoken plenty tonight, I, unless council would like me to apply further. No, that's uh, fine. I just wanted to <laughs> offer the opportunity. So. No, thank you for that. I think we're in good yep. shape. Thank you. Is there any uh, council discussion? Seeing none, could we have a roll call vote, Deb? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, next item is number 82-2020. Uh, item to set to a public hearing uh, a uh, the fiscal 21 proposed school budget. Uh, the school budget public hearing is recommended to be set uh, for June 8th. Uh, with subsequent town council vote on the school budget on June 15th. Um, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? And again, this is talking about setting it to a public hearing. I don't see anybody raising their hands. Uh, so is there any councilor looking to make a motion? I'll do it. Go ahead, Penny. Um, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council does hereby schedule a public hearing for Monday, June 8, 2020 at 7 p.m. via Zoom on the proposed fiscal year 2021 school budget as proposed by the Cape Elizabeth School Board with proposed expenditures of $28,490,012. And estimated revenues of two million two hundred and eighteen thousand nine hundred and forty nine three point seven nine percent change from fiscal year twenty twenty thank you uh, moved by Council Jordan is there a second Council Caitlin Jordan second. any discussion Council Devereaux? 
Well, I'm just curious what we're moving forward because um, I haven't seen a new budget. So we're actually moving forward the proposed budget that they gave us uh, previously. The motion is to set a public hearing for the budget that we have had presented to us. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then the subsequent vote on that would occur uh, on June 15th. So this is merely a motion to set a public hearing for the proposed budget as it stands on June 8th. Is there other discussion? I have a question for either Matt or Deb. Um, I, I haven't heard anything. I assume that you haven't either. And I know that you're both anxiously waiting information about whether or not um, there will be a school referendum vote or whether or not the action by the council on the 15th will be the final action on the school budget. Is there anything either of you can shed light on on that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Deb can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, she and I have been breathlessly awaiting uh, an executive order regarding uh, the June 5th, uh, sorry, the July uh, 14th election. Uh, we are, are anticipating it and it's been uh, teased, but I think uh, we still have yet to receive anything from the governor's office. So I know speaking with Kate Dufour and Steve Gove from Maine Municipal, I know it's an item that uh, the governor is currently considering, but we have not received any further information on that. The, the question may be regarding uh, further absentee approach, uh, but uh, I'm not sure if there's anything else, but as we receive more information and uh, in advance of the June 8th uh, public hearing, if there's any changes like that, we'll obviously make the council aware of it immediately uh, as soon as we learn of something, but we are anticipating something, but I've been saying that with Debbie for about three weeks straight now. So anticipation's killing us all. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there any other council discussion on the motion to set a public hearing? Councilor Devereaux? So um, I'm just curious if we um, vote to set this for hearing, uh, this will be the budget that the um, public will be reviewing, correct? So this. Yes. My understanding was the school was going to look at this, come back with a new proposal. Um, I'm guessing they're not, um, but if they did, it wouldn't matter, correct? Because we've already voted to put this forward to us to a um, public hearing. As we discussed before, the council can vote to accept, reduce or uh, um, increase the, the budget that goes to the public to vote on. So all of all this is, is to set a public hearing to receive input from the public on what they think of the only budget that we have before us, which is the one represented by this number. So during the joint finance workshops of uh, the town council and the school board finance committee, um, you know, we all received their presentation as you were all there, discussed it, um, we provided questions and feedback to the school board, um, provided follow-up when, when asked directly of, of having not received any specific direction to reduce the budget. Uh, I, I think as finance chair, I represented the view of the council that as I remember it from that meeting and was included and approved in the minutes was that there wasn't any counselor that uh, at those meetings expressed a desire to move forward with the budget as presented, that there was um, a desire from all counselors to look for ways to reduce both, not only the school budget, but the municipal budget as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so here we are having approved the municipal budget tonight, which included some reductions, and we have the school budget before us to have a public hearing on, on the 8th if we approve this motion. Okay. Is there other discussion? Seeing none, um, uh, Deb, could we have the roll call vote on this item? Councilor Devereaux? No. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. 
Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries five yay, one nay. Okay, thank you. Next item me. is, I'm me. sorry, was there a question? Yeah. Me. I, 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 you can tell me if I'm being inappropriate with, uh, but I just. Penny, you um, are out of order. I know, I'm so inappropriate. I just wanna, I understand, I, I think I understand, Valerie, where you're coming from, and I understand, and I'm not asking, saying change your vote or anything like that. I'm just saying I understand where you come from because it becomes kind of uneasy to um, uh, move forward with something that you may want to see a different action occurring on. But um, as, as Jamie stated, this is about hearing from the public and, and yes, they will be taught, uh, they will be seeing the, the budget that was put forward to us. That doesn't mean anything beyond the fact that we're going to hear from the public. And then we can take all of that input. And then I think where you're headed is we need to, um, peel the onion. Um, so I just, I just want to try to put you at ease that the step that we're taking isn't saying yes or no to the budget. It's saying we want to hear from the public as to what their thoughts, ideas, and hopes and dreams are. So I, I just wanted to say that because I didn't want you to feel uncomfortable. Um, Councilor Devereaux. Um, thank you, Penny. I, I completely understand that and I completely understand what the vote is about. However, I feel like um, my vote voting no is sending a message to them that I am extremely disappointed, extremely disappointed that they would not even consider sitting down and talking and looking over the budget to see if they could come to some, even if it was a slight change, they didn't even sit down with each other to give us the courtesy of that. And so my vote is basically saying, no, I don't think it's right that we um, put forward their um, 6% proposal to um, a public hearing. And I think it was extremely um, outrageous. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why I voted no, but thank you, Penny, for-, um, for I, I appreciate that and I really do. So thank you, thank you, Valerie. If there's no further discussion on that, the next item is number 83-2020, which is to um, uh, approve the election warrant. Uh, again, it remains to be seen um, what the, um, whether or not this will, you know, effectively be needed or not, I guess. But um, in the meantime, we do have to um, go through the action to approve it. Um, on the assumption that it will be. So this uh, item, uh, just for the purpose of clarification based on the discussion that's been happening on this and the previous item is that all it is approving is the language and the date uh, um, and location uh, for which the election is to take place on this item. Um, it doesn't have any reference to the uh, budget amount, um, but rather is the approval questions of yes, I favor uh, adopting the budget uh, that the council adopted or no, I do not. And then there's the non-binding um, directional question of too high, uh, too low, or just right. Um, so uh, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? I see no raised hand. So is there any counselor looking to make a motion at this point? Penny? Jer oh. Jeremy, it's your turn. Oh, Jeremy's turn. turn. Okay. Um, I'll move that the town council approve the following budget validation for referendum election warrant as presented in the agenda. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay. Is there a second? Penny, is there any okay. discussion? So I'm, I'm curious in light of the um, discussion that we just had about the governor's order, um, assuming that um, the governor comes through with an executive order that changes the rules around the budget adoption referendum and assuming that the council 
decides to exercise that option, uh, would we then have to repeal the warrant article? Have we ever got been in a situation where we've where we've committed a warrant article that was then not presented to vote? Matt, short answer: No. Uh, that would be uncharted uncharted waters. But I would believe that uh, any executive order that would make that type of change would have to come forward with the steps that one would have to take in order to do that. But uh, with this, uh, we need to get that information there, A, so we can get the uh, the ballots printed, but also B, because uh, uh, they need to be ready after the next, you know, after the June 15th uh, meeting to be ready to uh, hand out to folks the next day uh, if, if there is no change at all. So uh, if people want absentee, they can take that approach. But yeah, that's, that's never happened, so. And I just want to clarify um, in asking that question, I, even if the governor's order allows us to not hold a vote, I'm fully supportive of, I, you know, I would intend to present, the, <laughs> exercise any option available to us to present this referendum at election rather than vote by town council. That's just my personal position. Yeah, I mean, even, so just so areas where, even if the decision by the governor were to be, oh, well, we're, you know, we're still going to have voting on this, but it's going to be strictly absentee. There's going to be no in-person voting. We would still need this warrant to, you know, fulfill that purpose. So it's not just whether or not there's in-person voting or not, but. Uh, any other discussion? Seeing none. Um, can we call the roll for this vote? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. The next and final scheduled agenda item is number 84-2020. Um, not pertaining to the budget, but rather the town emergency order which expires, uh, is currently scheduled to expire um, June 30th at uh, 6 p.m. Um, so the council has taken uh, action in uh, uh, to pass emergency ordinance starting first on March 25th, followed by amendments on the 1st and 28th of April uh, to uh, a series of existing emergency orders that are linked in the packet. Um, is there any citizen from the public that wishes to speak on this agenda item? If uh, you do, please raise your hand uh, in the meeting function. I see no hands raised. Um, so are there any counselors looking to make any motions at this point pertaining to the standing uh, emergency order? Councilor Penny Jordan. Um, yes, I wanted to make a motion that we um, open Fort Williams to parking and vehicular traffic in addition to the pedestrian and uh, the biking. And as part of that, um, to continue to have dogs on leashes and encourage people to wear masks. So for um, clarity on your motion, um, the number one is the parking and vehicular traffic. Number two, as far as the, the leashes go, um, we can we can affirm it, but also don't need to necessarily mm -hmm. even include it because it's part of the standing emergency mm -hmm. action to the 30th. So no harm in affirming it, but no, no need to specifically include it either. And then you're looking to require mask no. wearing? No, no encourage. encourage. Okay, I couldn't remember what you said. Um, did you have a date that you wanted to, an effective date you wanted on this? Immediately. Immediately, okay. Um, is there a second? Second. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, second. Is there any discussion? Councilor Devereaux? Um, I understand um, where Penny's going with this, and we have so many people that have 
emailed us, um, either wanting the park opened or closed. Um, my concerns are that um, the virus infections are continuing to increase in Cumberland County. And um, with vehicular traffic, we're, we already have a lot of out of state people. We're gonna just, uh, we're gonna have more groups, more people coming to the park. I'm really hesitant to do that right now because once we open up and let's say there is an increase in infections in, in Cape Elizabeth even, how do we um, shut the park back down? I don't know if we can do that. So I guess um, I'd be willing to do that if we had um, social distancing, no groups larger than 10, um, set up some sort of one-way directional signage or even close off some of those really small um, paths along the cliff walk so that we don't have people bumping into each other. And I would make masks mandatory, um, especially if people are coming into um, proximity of other people. I think that um, this virus is uh, much more um, prevalent in uh, our community than people realize. And this, it is sunny, it's nice out. We've got a lot of people coming in. I just see it as um, creating, um, it's really creating a concern for me that we're gonna have much more infections um, if we don't have some sort of um, restrictions in place. Councilor Penny Jordan. You're on mute, Penny. Sorry. There you go. Matt, can you speak to where the state is at relative to Kettle Cove, Crescent Beach, Two Lights? Because I think this kind of works in partnership uh, uh, with where uh, they may be at at this point in time and we could align accordingly. Um, my, my position is, and I will go back to the many comments I've heard and, um, and seen, I, I, I guess I'm blessed to not have to go anywhere to have a lot of space. But Fort Williams is large. It's, it's a large space. And I think people can manage themselves. So Matt, can you talk about uh, where Kettle Cove, Crescent Beach, and Two Lights might be at at this point? Go ahead, Matt. You're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you caught at least one, <laughs> at least one time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the question, Councilor Jordan. Uh, speaking with uh, the park uh, coordinator, Kurt Schoner, today down at, uh, at the state parks, the state is planning on, a, uh, on an opening of their properties in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, they're, scheduled, they're looking at June 1st, so that would be Monday uh, next week is when they're looking to do a... Uh, I guess you could say a, a restricted form of opening. Uh, the details of that are going to be on the on the state's website at maine.gov, I think, forward slash parks. But uh, all three properties are scheduled to be open June 1st. So that may take a, a crush off from where we're at. I know, uh, I understand Crescent Beach is to be open in a limited capacity, uh, but it's a, it's a high volume park, meaning that it can, it can, accommodate a high number of people. So I think they're just looking to control that somewhat. Uh, Kettle Cove, I know they're looking to have a, a more controlled opening of that and two lights, I think uh, they're forecasting a full opening of that state park. So uh, I encourage folks to look at the website uh, for more details when it comes to that. But uh, they had initially intended to open June 1st, looked at an earlier date and then, and then decided to go back to the June 1st opening. Uh, along with some of the other state properties that they currently had closed. So, uh, but June 1st is the date that they're looking at there. And uh, the, uh, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, to Councilor Devereaux's uh, thoughts as well. Uh, we do have the electronic signage out front that uh, has allowed us with some flexibility where we could uh, encourage social distancing and uh, and encourage people to wear a mask as they enter into the fort, uh, as well as uh, we can restrict, uh, I think very successfully, the number 
uh, of folks who actually go into the park. Uh, speaking with Chris Cutter today, uh, who's our park coordinator down there, and uh, looking at controlling the parking, so possibly opening of the central lot, uh, the lot down by the lighthouse, or currently located in back of Councilor Straw's left shoulder, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> as well as uh, the Ship's Cove lot, and then shut off the uh, the picnic shelter lot. Uh, the parade grounds lot, and then, but also having the uh, the children's garden lot uh, uh, open as well for for that overflow area. Uh, but I think we, that's about half capacity there. Um, the other area uh, that I think, just to bring the council up to speed on, is is playgrounds. Uh, we did open the tennis courts and the pickleball courts last week, and that's been fairly successfully. People have been really responsible, from what I understand, going in there with that. We uh, we're following USTA guidelines when it came to that, even with the tennis courts at the school grounds as well. Uh, and then the playgrounds obviously is another question, but people have been using the playgrounds all along, but it's important to reinforce, uh, you know, and think about that, I'm, I'm thinking more along the ones across the street at the, on the school grounds. Uh, people have been using those. Uh, those are somewhat impossible to police, but it's important for folks to know, and we'll get some signage up saying, these, these playgrounds are not sanitized and we want people to understand that and then they need to wash their hands and do their best practices. And that's, that can be said across, uh, across multiple properties in, in our area, uh, just as the summer, summer season has come up and people are looking to find ways to provide diversions for their children. So, um, but I think we could, uh, speaking with Chris, accommodate folks in that capacity pretty, pretty well uh, and successfully they're ready to go. Uh, um, the gentlemen who work down there and ladies uh, we have for rangers and greeters have masks so we are looking to keep them protected in that and it is you know we do have the ability to say socially distance when you are helping folks out down there uh, but it doesn't have to be a minimum of six feet if your six feet is more like 10 feet and you can get your point across uh, we would want to take that approach and then the other the other question of course is porta johns and we we would want people to know that we are not going to have the uh, the the restroom facilities available. Uh, we have had some interesting developments down there, even with uh, with it restricted to um, pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, but folks have been pretty good about that. But I think you know that's one area that we are, uh, and I think most towns are taking that approach: is that they're not opening their port. You know, when they do have porta johns available, that they're not opening those just because it's it's one of the areas that are, are of high concern, and we just can't sanitize. Uh, all of those. Thanks, Matt. Um, Penny, I'm going to ask a question um, directly to you. Is there a reason um, that you, uh, you know, you specifically are looking to do it immediately versus in a couple of days on the first to be consistent? June first, with? June first is fine. I I would say be consistent with the state. And June first is almost immediately. Right. Um, so j just like when we um, uh, took action on this um, at our last meeting, I, I, I do think we'll need a few days um, mm -hmm. that w would be afforded to us with the June 1st date, um, you know, simply to, you know, change messaging uh, or get new messaging added um, where necessary. Um, Matt, w w is your view that we would um, uh, have the, the, pay and display program in effect with this as well? Yes, the, actually the machines are delivered tomorrow. Yep. And uh, Portland for that matter is going live with their pay and display parking June 1st as well. Uh, so that's across the region, those are coming back online. Hmm. Uh, we have uh, been working with uh, Unified Parking to have a lower incidence of touchscreen activity there. And they will have staffing on there. We will be looking to uh, try to routinely sanitize the units during the day as well. So uh, that, yeah, they were, we were looking at June 1st for installation that just coincidentally happens that tomorrow's the day that they're looking to uh, make the installation. Okay. Um, and can you update us just to, you know, for our benefit, but also the benefit of the public, commercial uh, activity um, in, is still off the table, correct? Uh, in the way of buses and vans and things like that. Not that there are, really are any to speak of, but? 
Yeah, I, th I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it's a question of uh, supply and demand. And uh, they, I know they've really pulled back their operations. Uh, so I, we're not anticipating a high volume when it comes to that as well. Uh, I think that's going to be, that's probably going to be looking at phase three type of thing from the governor's uh, implementation strategy as well. Uh, but I have a feeling that's going to be, that's going to be down as we go forward in the year. Is there any specific action that we should include in this to account for that or? Um, I, I think it's self-regulating to, to be honest and the bus traffic looking at the, the, the number of landings that have been reduced, uh, you know, the bus traffic as well. We're looking at that uh, and we've been in active discussions. I know Kathy has with uh, the bus tour operators, uh, at least those associated with the cruise ship industry uh, that they're, you know, we've been having a, a pretty live volume of conversations with them. So, uh, we, at this point in time, I don't think that the council would need to take action on it, but we may have to come back to that later in the later in the summer. Okay, and last thing for me. So, um, the great concern for me, having seen um, our limited reopening, has been two things. Um, number one is the not unexpected, um, but probably even even more than anticipated um, amount of impact to the streets immediately surrounding the fort uh, in terms of traffic and parking and things like that. I know that the council has heard from a lot of folks on that, um, expressing a, a lot of concern. Um, hopefully, obviously, with the with the reopening of the lots, that would be remediated. Um, I think we should still stand prepared um, to um, accommodate um, no parking measures if necessary. Um, so uh, I know that uh, our previous action on this um, sort of empowered both you and the police chief um, to take measures you saw necessary. So I would encourage us to, to have that still be in effect um, because I don't know that that problem is going to completely go away. I hope it'll be greatly reduced, but I don't know that it'll, it'll completely go away. The second thing, and I don't know that there's anything we can do about this because the state itself and members of the administration have even, even acknowledged um, in news briefings and, and news reports that the 14 day quarantine um, requirement uh, is is largely unenforceable. It's, it's an honor system kind of program, but um, it, you know, living in proximity to the park and being over there a fair amount in the last couple of weeks um, going up and down Shore Road and some of the side streets um, adjacent to the park. Um, it has been really shocking to see the number of out-of-state plates. Um, and so, again, I don't know that there's anything we can specifically do about that, but it's that that's my biggest concern, um, is not the necessarily the the increased volume of people, because I think it's, it is consistent with the state's phase plan, but um, my fear is of, of, you know, people coming from other potential hotspots, um, which judging by license plates, that, that is the case. So again, I don't, I don't wanna paint with too broad a brush there because I know that there are a number of people that have out of state tags that, you know, do live here for various reasons and maintain out of state tags and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's not to suggest that every single out of state plate is somebody who's just arrived um, for a vacation or something, but anyway, Matt. Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, uh, our plan would be to maintain the no parking signs that we currently have up uh, surrounding the, the Fort neighborhood at the present time. Uh, and I think that will, uh, over time, I think that will diminish it and we can remove those as we go uh, further into the future. But I think, you know, we'll keep those up for the time being. Uh, my hat goes off to the officers who've been down there responding. They have had their hands full. Uh, and, and, and as well as the residents in the surrounding neighborhood, they have been very, very good about this. We hear from them, but uh, they've been very tolerant, I think would be a good way to put it. Uh, they've had some interesting uh, interactions, I think, where folks just, you know, actually seeing someone parallel park between no parking, two no parking signs is, uh, is a new one uh, for many of us. But our, but our PD have been doing a great job down there working and trying to troubleshoot that. And I you know, uh, uh, Chief Fenn has had uh, some some specific details deployed uh, for that area uh, specifically, and uh, they've been working really hard when it comes to that. Um, I was on a manager's meeting on Tuesday morning for Cumberland County, York uh, County, and 
what your observation is 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 100 110% accurate for our entire region. Uh, many of those are all coastal communities mm -hmm. and lakefront communities and uh, you know I, I guess if it's my anecdotal evidence that I can provide you is even up in the hinterlands of gray uh, when I went to the hardware store on Saturday half the plates there were Massachusetts tags and uh, that's a function of living in a lake region uh, so uh, it is what it is we just and we do get questions from people calling into the town office uh, ask what their best practices should be and uh, we say well you know it may be unenforceable what, what we are requesting is folks try to do the best that they can to do this responsibly and if they can come up uh, you know well stocked and supplied and not have to and limit their interactions when they do are into that uh, that's kind of the best realistic approach that we can take because people do have properties and it's awful tough to limit their property rights when it comes to that uh, and effectively we're not going to be doing bed checks uh, to police that and, and as you also point out, we have a number of people who have been here for quite a while and their primary residence may be out of state, but they, uh, but they are here for the summer and they may have been here for two weeks and, and many folks have done that. And I think, uh, you know, folks are trying to comply as best as they can. And then you have obviously the, the other percent, uh, as Councillor Devereaux has pointed out multiple times, the 10% who caused the 90% of the reasons why we have laws in this country. So, um, mm -hmm. But I think, I think we can try to meet the burden as best as we can and follow the best practices uh, going forward. So uh, is there other discussion, other comments? Uh, Councilor Gabrielson? Um, yeah, thanks for teeing this up, Penny. I, I think um, I, I'm in support of reopening on June 1st. Um, I think the town has some flexibility in terms of managing parking areas and availability. I do think it's worth um, looking at explicitly limiting the maximum group size to 10 people. Um, and also, um, I, I, I think there, although I don't see, foresee a lot of problems, I think it's worth also explicitly stating that group use areas and commercial activities will remain, you know, will not be allowed. Um, I'd also um, like to see us push the effective date back to July 15th, um, which will take in the 4th of July weekend and also give us a chance to revisit this again at our July 13th council meeting. I don't know if Penny wants to take any of those as friendly amendments or not. Um, before we I think get to I'm that. Having So just one, one point I wanted to, so on, on your, I wanted to clarify, um, Jeremy, your suggestion on the limiting of people. Um, I'm looking at the um, state's phase plan right now. And um, in addition, yeah, so I, I, just, I was just curious, it's more restrictive than what the state's phase plan is. So can you speak to that a little bit? Getting together with a group of 50 people sounds seems pretty crazy to me right now. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't disagree, but I also, it's not strictly um, uh, prohibited or, or um, discouraged even, so. I, I, I guess I, I would, I think we should be consistent with the state. Um, I, I <laughs> that's, that worries me. I would say on a practical level, yeah, just one second, Penny. I would say on a practical level as well that unless there is a group outing or group function of some kind, which if we are lim if we are still curtailing that, then it, it's it's not likely that you just have fifty people plus show up and you know, or even you know, you know, half that is is often surprising, you know, but. So yeah, I think if, if we are, if we're keeping the group use areas closed and limiting commercial activities, the likelihood of a group of 50 people or more is low. Yeah. Penny, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to clarify those things. Go ahead. I just want, I just needed um, clarification, Jeremy. I didn't hear, I'm having some internet connection issues. Your July 15th, what was that? I didn't understand. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the current effective date on the order is through June 30th. Yeah. And 
I was just proposing that we push that back to July 15th so that this measure would remain in effect through the 4th of July weekend. Um, and the 15th would also give us a chance to look at it at our regularly scheduled July council meeting as well. Oh, cool. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I might recommend that we take those as separate things. Um, so uh, that we, we bundle up and wrap up the things pertaining to the fort operations, because I think we still do have, correct me if I'm wrong, one other thing still hanging out in the emergency order. Is that right, Matt? Is the fort thing the only thing that's still covered? Uh, or there's the fort and then uh, there's also uh, short-term rentals. Yeah, that's um, so. Um, I would suggest that we we wrap up any action on the fort and then separately take up a discussion on whether or not we want to extend the order beyond its current June 30 sunset. Um, is there other discussion, uh, Council Devereaux? Um, again, I think that we have a, a very unique situation that's different than Kettle Cove. We have a lot more visitors than um, Kettle Cove and they're doing a controlled um, opening. I, I agree with Jeremy that I think we need to limit or at least regulate large groups. What if a uh, hundred people come down there and they're all in a big group? We're putting our park personnel and our police at risk, um, not to mention other people um, in our community. I, I just don't think that's responsible. The other thing, um, do we really want to allow um, the buses to self-regulate. I, I, I kind of feel like it's our responsibility as counselors to regulate the commercial uses and to regulate the vans and the buses, because right now any of them can come in if they choose to. Um, I think that's really up to us, especially right, right now. Maybe in a month from now, the, the virus is um, not spreading in our community and we want to let buses come in. Um, but I, I think that's something we need to regulate. Uh, I just feel that that's our responsibility to do that. Um, we're putting a lot of people at risk. So those are my thoughts. I think Matt wants to clarify. I, I don't think what I was hearing was that we're not interested in regulating it. It sounded like there wasn't necessarily on a practical level activity anticipated, but go ahead, Matt. If, if, if I may, uh we could come back with an additional order or uh, perhaps after one week's worth of operations, June 1st to June June 8th, which would be in time for the uh, council uh, order, we could come forward with uh, a recommendation regarding commercial uh, traffic at that point for council to consider and uh, possibly take action on if that, uh, and that gives us, I know it sounds funny, but that gives us a full weekend as well in between that Monday and the following week. And we can have some evidence-based uh, as well as some discussions with the vendors who may be doing it and what their, what their uh, plans are looking like. And we can come back and let the council know what we can provide you for uh, information so you can have a better, better foundation to make a decision from, if, if that would be helpful. I think that's a good idea. Okay, we'll do that. So the discussion. Okay, so the motion as it currently stands on the table was to reopen the park to vehicular traffic um, immediately um, and have the uh, leash uh, uh, requirement remain in effect and encourage uh, the wearing of face coverings. Um, Penny, do you want to accept a friendly amendment to your original motion um, to uh, modify the uh, date to June 1st? Yes, I accept that. Okay, so, uh, and Caitlin, you were the one who seconded this motion, I think, correct? Um, yeah. So yep. you're in agreement with that? Okay, yes. so with that, with that friendly amendment accepted to June 1st, um, were there any other amendments that anybody wanted to propose to the, the adjusted um, amendment that Penny made? Okay, so we have a motion on the floor uh, to reopen the park to vehicular traffic uh, and limited parking uh, effective June 1 with the continuation of leash restrictions 
and encouragement of uh, facial covering for all visitors uh, to the park. Deb, can you please read the roll for the vote? Councilor Devereaux? You're on mute, Valerie. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? No. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries five yay, one nay. Okay, um, so that covers off on the operation of the fort. Are there other motions that anybody wishes to make at this point regarding the current emergency orders? Jeremy? Um, I, I, I guess I, I'd, I'd actually like to, I, I know you may give the effective date, but I'd actually like to go back to the port for a minute and, and, okay. um, and that um, make, it a, make a motion that um, group areas shall remain closed. Okay, motion to oh. um, have group areas remain closed. I second that. Seconded by Penny Jordan. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Councilor Devereaux? Is that specific enough, Matt, um, for us to say group areas? That, that, that was going to be my question. If, if I may, Councilor Gabrielson, I, I would take your intent would be for the uh, picnic shelter specifically, and because uh, uh, that's the one area, and uh, that was our intent as well going forward, was we were, we were not going to obviously schedule any programming for that or rental of it uh, for a while, uh, but if, but we can also monitor that. Uh, I don't know if I was going to ask, is the motion, is the motion needed since we're the ones that issue the, the, the permits for use? It's right. And then, the and then we can ask. just, and we, I, I think you can save it, uh, to be, to be frank. And then we can just operationally say, you know, at this point in time, we're not going to allow people to, to use the uh, picnic shelter and we'll just have to police that as it goes. And people, you know, we do have, we do have picnic tables that are out there and, uh, those can house, mm -hmm. you know, four to six people. And I think that might meet the smaller group participation versus yeah the uh, uh, we just yeah, I, I thought that the intent was to have picnic shelter off limits anyways as it as it went because we were going to keep that parking area closed as well that's acceptable to me i'll, I'll withdraw that motion thank you jeremy and I, I, yeah i would just reflect in the discussion here that um you know the the intent of the council is to continue to restrict group use uh just through the you know um, not issuing any permits. So whether that's the picnic shelter or, um, you know, any of the, the other group use requests that we get for holding events or, uh, you know, field use and things like that. So most, if not all have canceled at this point right. uh, for the yeah. season anyway. So the largest one we had up next to the beach to beacon, of course, uh, the national governors association, governors association was going to be there this summer as well. So all those have been pulled off the table at yeah. this point. Okay, so um, I'll uh, redirect the question again. Is there any other motion relative to the um, uh, emergency order, Chris? So not a motion, but just a clarification. So uh, sure. Matt, um, I think I saw some of the food trucks are in place and open at this point. Is that correct? Just so people that, are that is correct. Yeah, Chris uh, kind of just uh, sent me a text to remind me of that. Uh, they've been in there. Uh, Obviously, very very limited capacity, but they have been uh, open and available. And uh, based on the governor's uh, uh, press conference this afternoon, outdoor dining is uh, is a legal use. Uh, so that's a. But the thing is, they're going to have to. And we've spoken with them about this: is that they are going to have to obviously have social distancing, uh, much like you know, much like an ice cream stand does. Uh, you know, they'll have to mark that out so they can keep people with their six foot distance but they have been touched base on that. In, in uh, my recollection when I went through this weekend is I also saw people having, all the, even if we're shutting down the picnic shelter and things like that, I do recall seeing people uh, using the picnic tables um, and at least one group was using the, um, the barbecue grills. And obviously I've seen people playing wiffle ball in groups and Frisbee and whatnot. So even if we're, we're saying we're not letting these, group, these organized uh, group activities in that we have to approve, um, 
we there are group groups that are meeting of whatever size in the park that's going to be ongoing. If, if if I could respond to that as well, Mr. Chairman, I I, I know what we have uh, speaking with Chris about this as well today. Uh, folks have raised you know concerns to Chris as well as the Rangers that there may be a group that has a larger uh, you know a larger number. Uh, like one person that reported, they said, well, we've got a group of 20 people up there and they're doing this. And they went up there and there were 10 of them. And they said, well, okay, guys, uh, there are, and they, they knew, you know, they knew what the requirement was. And they said, there are only 10 of us. And uh, we said, well, could you grab a little bit more space than in between? And they, and people responded very well to that, uh, which, you know, uh, we see on the news much less uh, favorable stories uh, oftentimes in other areas, but folks have been pr pretty uh, receptive to asking them to, to grab a little space. Um, so that's at least when they're, when they're in the open areas like that. Um, Matt, have you and Kathy and Chris talked at all about the, the sort of keep moving guidance that we have out there? I think that's something that we're going to encourage uh, folks to do uh, to the extent that we can. Uh, you know, we'll encourage folks to keep, you know, not to linger, I guess would be a, bit, a good way to have it, but uh, that's just something that we'll have to do while we're on the ground, uh, definitely so. Penny? Um, I want to go with, back to the food trucks. Because I do understand that, yes, we can um, have outdoor eating and seating and stuff like that for restaurants. Um, my, this may be an odd question, but um, food trucks encourage lingering. And if we're trying to minimize lingering, um, and that, that's kind of counter to what we're trying to encourage, as well as um, food trucks, uh, um, have food and then usually bathroom facilities are needed in, in order to um, accommodate people who have eaten. So there's another contradiction. So um, was there um, the, an agreement that the food trucks would be back in the fort? Did we discuss that? And I could have missed it because I miss a lot of things. Uh, we had not discussed it, uh, but they do have contracts with us uh, to, to, you know, they have agreements that we have signed the leases with them. Um, Chris, just let me know there are no picnic tables around the food trucks as they are right now. So folks, you know, generally will grab their food and, and get into an area that's open. Uh, but I, I think I agree with you, Councilor Jordan, uh, the restroom thing, we just need to publicize the heck out of that and say, folks, you know, we do not have restrooms here. You need to be aware of that, uh, especially if you, <laughs> yeah, if something doesn't agree with you or what happens. Uh, but that's just one of those one of those things. We just need to publicize that heavily. Well, it is a large open space, so <laughs> carry in, carry out, please. <laughs> <laughs> Other. So Jeremy, you've withdrawn your motion. So other other motions pertaining to the emergency order. I have a question. Sure. Um, um, because I I um, I know that the inn is going to in by the sea will be opening on June first, and they'll have outdoor seating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, are we going to not that I really want to bring up this topic a lot, but the um, uh, short-term rentals, and I haven't seen anything in the state uh, changes around that. So are we just going to keep going status quo? It's, it's a, just a general question. So the most recent direction from the state was allowing lodging operators, and I they continue to be very non-specific <laughs> and vague exactly. and steering clear of the phrase or term short-term rental or Airbnb or anything like that. But mm -hmm. the, the most recent direction was that they would be able to um, accept reservations um, within right. the 14-day quarantine 
uh, right. remain in effect. So our current short-term rental ordinance, as you all know, Penny, and I know everybody else does, um, would seem to me to make it impossible for somebody to 14 day quarantine from out of state um, while doing a short term rental um, where the, unless they were to book for two weeks in a row. So, right. right. Okay. Um, again, this is something we have no ability whatsoever to police. Um, so I think the question becomes, and, and, you know, I'll say, um, I, I know that there are, um, you know, there are certainly people looking to skirt our existing rules that we've put in place on this uh, and actively trying to do that. So, um, okay, I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. And again, ask if anybody wishes to make any motion pertaining to the st existing standing order. Matt? Mr. Chairman, not, obviously not to make a motion, but a point of uh, uh, hopefully clarification is as it sits now in the order, the uh, short-term rental uh, prohibition at this point stands until June 30th based on the emergency order. Just just in case folks were concerned that June 1 was the date that it was coming on, but it's, it's, that's, that's through the yep. month of June as well. Correct. Thank you. So we'll have two other scheduled times where we'll be together between now and June 30th, where we could, um, if needed, add additional um, noticed agenda items pertaining to this topic if we felt that necessary. Right. Okay. Jeremy, did you want to add something? Uh, no, and based on that, I'm fine to stay with the effective date as it stands for now. Okay. So unless there's anybody else looking to add or amend to anything relating to the standing order. I do have a question, Matt, um, without looking to open up a, a can of worms um, on, if you could just update us on, um, I know you've provided some feedback, you and Kathy um, were on some emails, Kathy Raftis, um, about the pool. Um, if you could just for the purpose of the meeting and the public, um, give a little bit of an update on that. And then sure. I have a follow up question to that, but stick with the pool first. Sure, no, I'd be happy to. Uh, we're looking to open the pool up in a limited capacity beginning on June 8th. And what we are looking to do there is have folks that'll need to schedule, uh, or, uh, make a reservation uh, for a 30 minute window. Uh, and it's, we have six lanes available and the recommendations have been uh, for uh, one swimmer per lane uh, versus a circle swim or anything along those lines. Uh, based on the square footage of what we have for the building, uh, we're looking to have that. I, I think we fall within the restrictions uh, or within the allowed uh, group that we have in there. Uh, we do have the staff ready to go and uh, we just need a little bit of time uh, to, to get everything up to speed for scheduling and getting that ready for folks to be able to use it. Uh, pools originally were in the phase three plan, which was supposed to be open on July 1st. Uh, that had since been revised by the governor to be included in phase two. Uh, wasn't really well publicized, so we weren't aware of that. Uh, but that's how, how we were approaching it originally, looking at a July 1 open. Uh, so we have we have worked on trying to get that available and ready. Uh, the locker rooms obviously won't be available, so folks will have to pay attention and, and come prepared uh, to swim uh, right from there. They'll also have to bring their own equipment if they want to use kickboards or things along those lines. Uh, we won't have those available for them, but they're more than welcome to bring their own. Uh, there is a, a, a lavatory available on the deck uh, that will be sanitized uh, multiple times throughout the day uh, to keep that. The hot tub itself obviously won't be available. Uh, so that's, uh, but that's what we're looking at for the pool facility. Uh, the fitness facility, we're looking at possibly reopening that for August 1st, uh, just due to the square footage of that and uh, the inability to really transfer a lot of air. Everything in there has been completely sanitized. All the work's been done, so it's ready to go. It's just a question of making it, having it be a safe environment. And you've seen where the, uh, the recommendations from the governor's office have been revised a couple of times regarding uh, fitness facilities and, uh, you know, especially of the larger scale. So with us being of the shorter scale, I think we've got some challenges there that hopefully we're, we're gunning for August 1st for that. Valerie? 
Uh, thanks. Matt, can you also talk to, uh, um, to us about uh, community services and what you're planning to do with the um, children's summer camp? Uh, thank you, Councilor Devereaux. I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, we are looking to open on Ju uh, June 22nd for the uh, for the Cape Summer Camps, and what we uh, Kathy and Kelly Finney have worked on uh, in consultation with multiple departments across the, across the state, to uh, as well as the governor's most recently provided checklist on safe reopening. Uh, they've worked to be able to check off every box that. Uh, that looks like we're, we're good to go to open up safely. Uh, we have uh, a 10 to one camper to counselor ratio. Uh, they've come up with a creative approach to uh, get kids uh, to safely uh, socially distance uh, by having uh, hula hoops, which happen to be about three feet across and having the kids when they wanna sit down for lunch or sit down time, they'll have to sit within their circle. So the, they should keep them hopefully socially distanced. <laughs> We have uh, multiple easy ups that we've been purchasing. Uh, obviously, we're not gonna have uh, transportation available to get kids to and from home to camp uh, because of just the uh, social distancing is a huge challenge there. Uh, hand sanitizers as well as uh, uh, temperature readings are gonna be available to be taken in uh, as well as qualifying to make sure kids are not coming in uh, unwell uh, as well as masks for uh, campers as well as, uh, as staff. So. Uh, they've really looked at this comprehensively and tried to check off every box, and I think they have, because uh, ultimately it's the safety of the of the participants as well as staff that uh, we want to make sure kids have a a fun uh, a fun program, but also a safe program. And uh, the desire was there. We have about 90 kids signed up uh, for this, so uh, we've increased staffing levels there as well to try to uh, accommodate uh, the needs for all the different campers. Uh, but I think they've, you know. We're hoping for a, a, a nice sunny summer, <laughs> to say the least. But yeah, there will be no field trips. Normally, they would once a week they'd go to Fun Town or uh, one of those different amusement parks or something along those lines. That that's not going to happen. But they're they've been working hard to make sure we have some great on-campus programming for the kids. Thanks. That was going to be my second question. So. Thank you very much. I, I Any, have some additional oh, information, if, if that'd be good, Mr. Chairman, as well. Sure, yeah. Uh, and we'll, we'll be getting this out uh, by the end of the week. I know uh, the end of the week is approaching rapidly, but uh, we are looking on Monday to open up uh, a greater level of, uh, of operations here at the town office. Uh, starting on Monday, June 1st, we're looking to have, uh, by appointment only, from the, between the hours of 8 to 3, Monday through Friday, uh, so folks, if they need to do in-person uh, transactions, such as a new car transaction, uh, private sale uh, registration, uh, things along those lines that they can't do online, uh, we're, we're going to have that available in time slots to get folks into the building so they can do that on a scheduled basis. Uh, looking at the square footage requirements for Town Hall, we can have up to five people in the building uh, who aren't working here. Uh, so we're, we're, we kind of fall into that range. Uh, so what we're looking at is having one person available at the uh, tax collector side, uh, one person that may be able to work with the clerks uh, when they can't do an online transaction. Uh, so we'll have them available there, uh, as well as uh, scheduling with assessing codes and planning on a 15 minute slot basis uh, for that. So contractors, if they can't get permits online or have questions, we can schedule them. If they need more time, obviously they're not gonna be limited to just a 15 minute window. Uh, so we're so we're looking to get those opened up and uh, you know in a more con you know originally we were trying to figure a way that we could have it more open and then quite frankly the uh, situation at Cape Memory Care came up and raised a high level of concern for uh, for myself as well as the staff uh, and concern about their their welfare as well as consultations with other communities and what their opening plans are and I think we fall right in line with them uh, the one. One thing that we're looking at is uh, Cape's been working all along, and so we, you know, our staff has been has been coming in with regular hours and taking care of many of the transactions that we need to that we need to get done. Other communities haven't done that. Uh, a couple of managers I was on with the other day, uh, they were talking about the day that they did their uh, soft reopening, and they had lines of 60 to 70 people outside of their building. Uh, that's that's not what our goal is. <laughs> so we feel that if we can get, you know, we're, we're obviously happy to walk folks through 
online transactions. I've uh, done it myself. Uh, we're happy to help then. Uh, many, if, if a person does not have the ability to do that, then obviously we'll make it able so they can come in with a scheduled time and we can get them through uh, with their transactions. But we'll have that all laid out and on the website and uh, we'll reach out and we'll have information downstairs on the doors. We are controlling access coming in through the southern side entrance, um, which is the handicap accessible side of the building. And then we are gonna ask folks to wear a mask when they do come in to do transactions. And we do have plexiglass installed in our forward facing areas, uh, but we are looking to try to make sure folks are, are safe and, and sound, uh, our visitors as well as, as well as our staff. And then uh, uh, the other item that may be of interest is, uh, we did let the council know a few weeks back that we had furloughed some employees uh, at the library and community services specifically. And uh, as we ramp up our operations, we're looking to have them come back. We're probably looking at the library side of it coming back in July. Uh, June's gonna be in a curbside month at the library and Rachel has crafted an exceptional plan. Uh, it helps that it's very close, closely aligned with the South Portland plan, uh, happens to be the you know, our, our library director is married to their library director. So we've been taking advantage of some excellent bandwidth there. They've got, they've got a really good plan uh, to go forward with that. They have been killing it with their online programming though. They have been getting like upwards of 60 to 70 people to do that. So I think that's something we're gonna look at in the future to keep, to keep providing for folks. Cause I think they've, we've really opened up an opportunity there. So that's, that's you know, there are good things that, <laughs> if one could say this out of a pandemic can be found, this is one of the good things that, that has come from this uh, creative approach. Um, so that's, that's kind of exciting. And then uh, a couple other areas we're looking at, uh, like with our, with our folks at community services, some are related to the fitness facility, um, but some of those folks will be coming back as well as we uh, come online with those operations. And then finally, uh, there's been some uh, interest in the bottle shed and the uh, swap shop. Of the two, the bottle shed will probably be the closer one to come online uh, earlier rather than later. And it's a heck of a challenge just with the swap shop because it is such a, such a cherished asset in the community and, and nothing bothers anybody more so than watching things that we all consider are, are, would be perfectly useful to someone else uh, go in the hopper, uh, unfortunately. But uh, until we can find a way to safer, safer do that. And I think, uh, you know, I understand Goodwill uh, is reopening June 1st, uh, but they've been processing all along. That's staffed for us by volunteers and uh, we're trying to find a way that we can do that safely, but uh, we have to stay tuned for future updates when it comes to that. At this point in time, we're probably looking at August, possibly September for both of those assets, but probably the, um, the ball shed would be coming online sooner uh, of the two because that's, you know, that's easier to manage uh, and cleaner. That's a great update, Matt. Thank you. Any questions for Matt? The, the, the only last thing I want to just say is I want to thank our staff downstairs. They have been, you know, the fact that they've been churning away and coming up creatively and helping folks do, uh, you know, for new registrations, helping them do that via the uh, correspondence route, which we're still happy to do as well. If people are uncomfortable coming in, uh, we would strongly encourage online as well as as well as correspondence if that would be helpful helpful for people. But other towns have looked at this and said, "Hey, we're just going to send you to the DMV to get plates," and we haven't taken that approach. We'd much rather have people be able to get what they need here as best as we can. So um, we'll we'll obviously as we go forward through the month of June, we'll check and adjust when it comes to volume that we'll have coming into the clerks and collections area. But uh, we're try probably looking at this going forward through the month of, uh, of June and then expanding as we go forward and uh, it's looking in, in relationship to the governor's recommendations. That's all, that's all I have on it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any questions for Matt? Okay, um, before we close the meeting, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak about something that was not on tonight's agenda. Now is your opportunity to do so. Uh, raise your hand in the Zoom meeting function. I don't see any hands raised. So is there a motion to adjourn? 
So moved. moved. <laughs> Second. Give that, give that one to Caitlin, followed by Penny. Assuming no discussion. Deb, can you roll call us? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Sharon Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that concludes the meeting. I hope everyone has a great night. I hope uh, I get another chance to chair a meeting or participate in a meeting from my screen porch. This has been absolutely pleasant, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.